Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming again today. So uh, this is our fourth webinar, and, and some, if not all, of you have had a chance to see the first few that we've been doing. We've been talking about the, uh, the Africa to America's uh, rowing event that's taking place right now. The Canadian Wildlife Federation is sponsoring these four fellows rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. And we're taking this opportunity to, to talk about what the ocean is, how it works, how we affect it, and today I want to talk about what you can do to actually help it and what we talk, from what we talked about the other day. So I'm going to get right into it. There's a lot to talk about here. So, once again, quick introduction. My name is Sean Brilliant. I'm the, the manager of the National Marine Conservation Program for the Canadian Wildlife Federation. My background is marine ecology, marine biology, and, and uh, I've, I've had a chance to study and play with organisms in the ocean for the last 20-some uh, years now. I'm based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm, on, I'm in the Oceanography Department of Dalhousie University, where CWF's marine program is based. So, <clears throat> just as a quick aside, I decided to, I started to think, oh, maybe I should take a look at how you guys are actually physically connected to the ocean. And I wasn't sure whether you guys even knew, or, and I certainly didn't know either. But my best guess is that you're around here on our country. Does anybody know where you are connected to the ocean? Does anybody actually know? Does anybody want to guess? Are you connected to the Pacific? Are you connected to the Atlantic? Are you connected to the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah, some of you may know, some of you don't. I'm going to show you here. Okay, so here you are. Here's Canada's water the gals. And I think you can see right here, here where your connection uh, to the ocean Sean, is. Sean, you will just heard me come in now with a microphone. Here you are. Because one of the young gentlemen said connected to the Pacific. No. Pacific. Does that look like the Pacific Ocean? Connected to the ocean. Which ocean? Hudson Bay. Which ocean is Hudson Bay connected to? The Arctic Ocean. Yep. Or at least if we take a look back, certainly somewhere between the Arctic and the Atlantic, it eventually spills out into the Atlantic, the Hudson Bay more specifically, which is an inland marine water. So that's where you guys are connected. That's your physical connection from where you live to Canada's part of the ocean. So just something to keep in mind. But you have lots of other connections to the oceans too, and that's what I want to talk about today. Here's what we talked about in the last webinar, you know, the various uses we have for our oceans and sort of the abuses that come along with these uses and, and you know, overfishing and we use the ocean for transportation but there's bound to be ship strikes with wildlife and there's oil spills and we live on the ocean so there's coastal development and we produce sewage so there's sewage outfalls and CO2 issues because of our fossil fuel burning. But really, I got looking at this and I was thinking, everybody sees these things and what do we do about them, right? Like, what can you guys actually do about it? You're grade 7, grade 8 class and, you know, you're looking at, well, what can I do about habitat destructive fishing or coastal development or litter and plastic? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. We're going to go through several, I think, five different things I have that I want you to, to do. And here's the first one and you're already sort of doing it. Learn about the ocean. And then more importantly, talk about the ocean. More specifically, I'd like to see you educate yourself, inform others, and influence others to understand what those connections are. So you don't need to be a marine biologist to, to, to study and affect and protect and conserve the ocean, right? I can have discussions with people about how they should fish. I can talk to fishermen about different ways that they should fish. I can talk to the government about making rules for how they can fish or how they should protect different areas. But you can sort of do the same sort of thing. You don't need to have these specific rules, but you need to want that to happen. And by you telling, knowing what you want to happen and telling people what you want to happen, that makes a big difference. There's a lot of wildlife out there. You have the right, you have the right actually, to say what you want done with, these, with our oceans and with this wildlife. The oceans are owned and the wildlife in them are owned by all Canadians. They are managed mostly by the federal government, on our behalf, but you have the opportunity to say how you want that done. Now is a little bit weaker. Uh, um, you're sort of a pre-voting age and, and you're only sort of coming up and coming of age, but you will make a difference. And if you tell people that you want things changed, whether they are the decision makers locally in your municipality or provincially, 
you know, and even your province doesn't even own a piece of the ocean, and also federally, you're a part of this country, you have a say in how the ocean is done and, and what needs to happen. You can also speak with industries about how they do things. A lot of what happens in the ocean happens because we as a society want things done and these uses and abuses of the ocean happen because of that. So it's only by communicating this and it's only by being aware of it that you can make a difference. So that's the first thing. That's the first thing. The next thing you can do, reduce energy use. I know you hear this all the time. People talk about climate change and they talk about CO2 reductions, but this is a legit thing. We really need to find ways to reduce our energy use. We did the survey the other day. I think everybody uses or is uh, has the privilege of using a car and being moved around. People talk about electric cars and opportunities for new technology and ways to, to solve these problems, but it's not always going to do it. We need to make big changes in how we use energy. And we need to make sure we don't fall into the trap to think we're actually doing enough. There is always more to do. There was recently a survey in the US where they talked to a lot of people and said, listen, what are you doing for for you know global climate change? Are you doing anything to reduce your energy use? And the one thing most people said is, yeah, I turn out lights when I leave the room. And it's like, wow, is that it? Like, of course you should do that. We should not be wasting energy, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And you guys need to try and find the way to do these things and reduce our use of fossil fuels and non-renewable resources and, and things that sort of have impacts on our environment and the marine environment in a real way. So this is something else you really can do, okay? A big difference. <coughs> Pardon me. The next thing, plastics. We need to reduce our dependence and our use of plastics. Water bottles, bottled water, also a big issue. So much water is available to us. We have this privilege in this country and, and this luxury of having so much water. We don't need to be packaging it in plastic and, and delivering it through vending machines. There are other ways to do this. Yes, if you do use it, you want to make sure you dispose of it properly. You want to make sure there are recycling facilities and so on. But you still need to make sure we reduce using it. Even if we don't use plastic bags anymore, and plastic bags are another big one that you really want to try and reduce, even if you're very careful about disposing of it properly, if someone down the, the path doesn't dispose of your plastic bags properly, they're going to get out into the environment and that's where they cause problems. And even when they don't, not all of the plastic does, gets recycled, it breaks down and gets into our environment. We need to just find ways to stop using them. They have, plastics have benefits, of course, in terms of food safety and health, but we've had We've had products and food for many, many years, and we need to we need to look for when there is overpackaging and unnecessary use of plastics and un unnecessary use of, of packaging, and look for ways to reduce that. And more importantly, coming back to my first point, is telling people that you don't want it this way. That is very important too, and that makes a big difference. Here's one thing we can reduce too: balloons. Oh man, I know everybody likes balloons. They're very popular. They look very nice. Kids like them especially as well. But I'm afraid they don't serve any purpose other than this, and yet they last for years afterwards and can cause all kinds of problems afterwards, too. Balloons are things that, that we really need to see if we can find a way to eliminate and maybe find an alternative to. I was looking for pictures of balloons to show you a picture of balloon while I talked about this, and I found this picture. This is a wallpaper for someone's computer. You can actually put this on your computer. And I thought, is this supposed to be a good thing? Look, there's like... 200 balloons being released into the atmosphere and watching them float away. That's, this is like a nightmare wallpaper for me. I couldn't believe how terrible looking this is. Yeah, it looks very pretty, but we need to start to become much more conscious of what the consequences of our actions are. And this is, this is one that we really don't need to do. We need to find ways to, to, to change that. Okay, next one, seafood. This is a fun one. This is what we need to do with seafood. So, um, we did a quick survey of seafood eaters. There were a few seafood eaters in this class, I think, from the last, but I'd, I'd be curious to know how many people eat marine seafood, not just, um, not just fish, but, you know, marine fish or lobsters or clams and so on. You buy these things from the market or you go to a restaurant and they get served to you in a restaurant. The new social norm when you're eating seafood is to ask what fish it is, how they caught it, and where it came from. This feels foolish. In fact, my colleagues at Canadian Wildlife Federation are embarrassed to go eat with me when I go to these restaurants because I make them ask questions and say, where did this, what kind of fish is this and where was it caught and, and you know, where did it come from and how was it caught as well? 
don't be afraid to ask these questions. This is wild food. This is food caught in the wild and brought to our table for us to eat. There's not much food that is like this anywhere. Most of our food is raised on farms and, and so on, but seafood is not this way. If the servers, if, if the, the, you know, the serving staff don't have the answers, they can go talk to the kitchen staff and see if they have the answers. If they don't have the answers, you can't, you shouldn't buy that. You're buying something you have no idea what the consequences are. So don't be afraid to ask it because it also educates people. It makes them aware that they have to have this information. Now what is good and what isn't good to eat is much more challenging, right? Rockfish is a, is a slow growing fish that's endangered but they still fish it in some areas. There are some species of sharks that are critically endangered and yet there are still fisheries that are going on for them. There are some fish you clearly shouldn't eat and there are others that are okay to eat. And to decide which those are, you need to, you need to learn, you need to educate yourself, you need to look at options. And there's a variety of uh, recommendations and sites out there for telling you what fish are okay and which ones aren't. The same is true asking about how the fish were harvested. You know, was it, was it dragged from the bottom? Did, it, did you catch a hundred, you know, kilos of shark, but you caught a thousand kilos of bycatch that you threw back into the ocean that died? That's not an acceptable fishing method. You need to educate yourself about what fishing methods are acceptable and which aren't. But, but that's a whole other discussion and it's stuff that we need to have. It's a responsibility that we all have to know these things and make these decisions so that the decisions we're making, we know what the consequences are of the decisions we're making. Here's a neat story. Here's a fish. Um, I'm curious, I wanted to find a picture of this fish to show you guys. And I'm curious to know if anybody knows what kind of fish this is. And while you're deciding if you know what kind of fish this is, when I was looking for a picture of this fish online, I could not find a picture of this fish. I found pictures of this, and I found pictures of this, and I found pictures of this, and I even found pictures of this. But the fish itself was so hard to find, I couldn't find an actual picture of it. Does anybody know? I'm just curious. You don't even need to tell me. I'm just curious if anybody knows what kind of fish this is. And I'm being really unfair here because this is a very common Atlantic fish commonly eaten here, so you, you may not get it there, but I know it is distributed across Canada as well. So um, in case you haven't figured it out or you may not know, and, and I wouldn't be surprised, this is a haddock. Haddock is a very common fish that we eat here in the Maritimes, and when I talk to, to students and adults here in the Maritimes and I show them a picture of a haddock, they don't know what it is. They recognize a haddock like this. This is how they tend to see it because we don't tend to see our food as, as wildlife, especially our marine food, pardon me. And that's a big challenge too. What is seafood and what is wildlife? Here is a cod. Is a cod Canada's wildlife or is it only food, something to be harvested? What about bluefin tuna? Crab, snow crab, what about lobsters? Do we ever even think about lobsters as being wildlife or are they simply something that lives in the ocean that we have the right to go scoop out and eat? I don't know about if we have the right to go scoop out and eat, but they're certainly both. They are things that we eat, but they are also a part of our wildlife heritage. They are actually wildlife, and we need to treat them that way and understand them that way too. Doesn't mean we can't eat them, doesn't mean we can't harvest them, but we need to recognize that they have a greater status than just simply existing there so that, so that we can harvest them and sell them or, or eat them or something. And we need to keep this in mind. Marine seafood in particular suffers from this from almost more than almost anything else. Okay, the next thing to think about is marine travel and purchases. How many people here, I'm curious to know, have traveled to warm places in the south, on the coast, perhaps gone snorkeling or scuba diving on a coral reef? You know, anywhere that's sort of warm and, and south of here that doesn't have to deal with Canadian winters. You know, it's a common um, uh, escape. Uh, cruise ships are another one. I have, I've gone both to uh, uh, Holidays in the south and on the coast, eight, very interesting, nine, nine, very interesting. And a cruise, I've even gone on a cruise ship as well. So we all, we use these things, these are something that we do, but we need to be aware of the consequence. And three on, four on the cruise ship, very interesting. So, <laughs> we need to be aware of what the consequences these are as well. Many of these resorts, for example, in the south are built on beaches. Are they natural beaches or not? Were those beaches used by wildlife or not? Turtles, for example, nest on these beaches. Have these turtles lost habitat because there is now a resort there where we attend? These are just the questions you need to ask. I'm not, you don't need to feel bad about them. You don't need to make other people feel bad about them or, or assault them with this information, but you need to know what the consequences are of the decisions we're making and try and make better ones as well. 
Um, opportunities to interact with wildlife, particularly in vacation places, are another problem, another potential problem with marine wildlife. Feeding um, wildlife, marine wildlife, like dolphins and so on, also sort of a bad thing. It's always dangerous um, interacting with wildlife. And when we start feeding them and getting them dependent on us, it makes it makes for very bad things as well. Diving on a coral reef is, is mind-blowing. It is absolutely amazing. It is one of the most amazing things to see on this earth. But tour companies that have poor practices and allow people to stand on reefs or collect pieces or break things off and be careless, this is not good. And you, you, know, you don't want to support uh, businesses that are giving you a holiday vacation at the expense of their own marine wildlife, our marine wildlife, our shared wildlife. And you, you can't do it. There are lots of opportunities and there are lots of places that do a good job of this. And they're learning more and more that people are aware of this. Right? Before they weren't aware of it. We didn't think anything of it. There was lots of coral reefs. We thought we could stand on them and we wouldn't hurt them. Well, it turns out it does hurt them and we can't do it that way. There needs to be a new way of doing things and you need to be informed and understand what those ideas are and what you can actually do. Purchasing um, knickknacks uh, uh, or souvenirs and so on, shells or pieces of coral is also something that you need to be aware of that has an effect because obviously somebody harvested these things. The marine aquarium trade is something you need to be aware of too and ask questions about. Um, a lot of these fish that are, are more and more are being bred in captivity and sold and that's great. But nonetheless, the vast majority of fish that you get, tropical fish that you get for aquariums are wild caught. They are caught in the wild in warm tropical areas. They've kept, they're sort of kept some, somewhat safe and, and healthy until they can get to the market in, in a developed world and then they sell them. And, and you need to know that if you have a marine aquarium, you need to know where your fish came from and, and, and how you take care of them. And you need to educate people about the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it and what the options are. And, and that's very important too. So, so just to sum up then, what can I do about all these things, about these challenges that we have in the ocean? Well, here are the five that I think are, are really important. Inform, educate, and influence. Reduce your energy use. Reduce the use of plastics. Pay attention to the seafood that you consume and how it's harvested and where it comes from. And pay attention to how you affect the ocean directly when you travel or make purchases that affect the ocean. And really, this first one, inform yourself, educate yourself and others, influence others to do the right thing and understand what the right thing is or learn for yourself what the right thing is too. And everybody has a role in this. It's not simply people who like the oceans, people, marine biologists who study the ocean. You know, it, it doesn't matter what your role or position or what you do in life is, you have a role in accomplishing all of these things and, and helping to preserve wildlife. The ocean is huge and, and this row from Africa to Americas has really shown us a, a, a glimpse of just how large this is and, and what, a, what an, an amazing and alien world it is. It consists of things that we can't understand, but it also consists of things that we need it is a part of what allows us to live in this world. It is a source of food for us. It is a source of um, transportation. It is a source of recreation. It is the reason our planet operates in a way that allows us to survive. And we need to understand that how we survive and how we use the ocean is affecting everything, all of, all of the wildlife, from the tiniest parts to the largest species that we can see we're clearly affecting. We have effects on all of these things. You guys have a great opportunity um, no one influences adults and parents better than their children. You guys are the best at it. Not as good as teachers, not as good as politicians, not as good as government or, or NGOs or anything else. Students and youth do it the best. And as 7-8, within five years you are going to become decision makers in this society. You will be affecting, you will be influencing who gets elected and who makes decisions on your behalf. You will be in jobs and positions that make dis make actual decisions that affect how individuals and business and society affect our environment, including how it affects the ocean. And you may go on and study further and get more involved in, in more specifically uh, how, to, how to conserve wildlife and conserve our natural resources. So you guys are, you guys are in, a, in a point where you are just coming into learning what your influence is going to be and how you can make differences in the world and to make sure things are done different than how they have been done up to this point and the mistakes that have been made. So you have a chance to correct them. And don't forget that because you have a lot of opportunity ahead of you. So that's all I'm going to say. Listen, it's been really great giving me a chance to talk to you guys about these things. I love having a chance to talk about them. Um, if anybody has any questions now, I'll certainly take them. But if you have a question down the road that comes up, here's my email. 
give me a call or, or, or send me an email. I'm happy to help you out any way I can. And if you have any questions now, I'll ask them, answer them as well. Thanks, Thank Sean, you. for all that. You're going to hear that tinny sound in the background now as I've opened the microphone here. And yes, there are definitely some questions. We have one right in the very front. Now, I'm going to turn the light on for this so you can actually see me. I know, you're all vampires, and now it's hurt. Okay, sh now you got to speak loud. Okay? How long have you been a marine biologist? Well, they don't, um, they don't uh, stow the title on me or give me a tattoo or anything. It's, uh, I started studying marine biology um, probably a little over 22 or 23 years ago. And then uh, after I went to school and university and studied marine biology, I immediately started working in different, um, in different fields related to it, different surveys for shellfish and so on. Anyway, it's been about 20 years that I've actually been employed as a marine biologist and doing research on marine biology. We have a question way in the back there as well. Did you have a question? I thought I saw your hand go up. Anyone else with a question? Nobody with a question. Everybody's happy campers. I guess that major essay that you've got them doing shortly, they've got all the answers for. Them. All the answers. They have all the answers. Excellent. Well, Sean, I love I thank you for your time that you put into this. Uh, it's been fantastic. The four webinars you've done with this group. Uh, and I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot as well, and going from there, and I do, I do come from a place that is waterlocked called Southern Ontario originally, so I'm used to water, but I want to thank you on behalf of everybody here and look forward to other things in the future with you as well. Thank you very much, Sean. Bye. 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 And remember, if you've got any questions or anything in the future, please feel free to contact me. Pardon? That's right. <laughs>